not a ton of like cities and towns and stuff like that. So you'll have to kind of imagine that a little bit. <laughs> but um, uh, without further ado, I think I'll let David take over. And thanks again for taking some time out of your day to, uh, um, to hear our, our talk. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, it's um, it's uh, our pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Luke for getting this organized and, and thinking about us when he was doing some of these uh, talks this, this summer. Um, and I also want to thank, thank Tucson Audubon, which has been a great supporter of us as well over the years. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with them. Um, like Jen said, I'm going to give you a little trip down into Sonora, virtually. Um, it's basically following a route that I would do on a normal Soli Paso trip. Um, uh, hold on a second. Oh, here. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Oops. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so this is uh, just to get everybody oriented here. Here we are in the, the big country of Mexico. It's a very large country, as some of you know, and some people don't realize how big it is. Um, Tucson up here in the the upper uh, upper left, and um, this whole green state here, that's Sonora, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And here's a physical map of Mexico, just to give you an idea of um, how mountainous the country actually is. It's about 85% mountains, um, and uh, Sonora up here in the uh, left is a little more diverse than some parts of the country. You see you've got some low coastal plain and some high mountains. Uh, as well as some desert areas in the uh, northern part. And this is a map of just the state of Sonora, just to give you an idea of where we're going to be this morning. Um, Tucson is more or less right above the northern middle part of the state. And this is the actual route that I would drive you on today if we were taking off, uh, starting an eight or nine day trip. And um, this whole northern section through here where the road is quite a bit straighter, that's all mostly Sonoran desert habitat. Um, still gonna see a lot of saguaros in there and some beautiful valleys full of Palo Verdes, et cetera. Um, and then from Hermosillo, typically I drive up to Yacara up in the Sierra Madre and then down through Ciudad Obregón, the south, and then over to the east to Alamos. And then on the way back, we retrace a little bit of our route, but we'd also go out to the coast Check out San Carlos, Isla Wibulai, um, before heading back north to Tucson. As you can see there, if we just drove it straight, it's 25 hours of driving and 1,150 miles. So that's why it's good to do it in a, a number of days. <laughs> and I just threw this map in to sort of give you an idea of um, where the habitat designations are, lines are of habitats. Uh, up here in the uh, upper left-hand corner where the Hermosillo and Tucson are, you can see that's Sonoran Desert habitat and sort of the, the uh, where most of it lies. Uh, we're gonna talk about some exceptions to that in a minute. Um, and then this long darker line that goes down uh, just up from the coastal plain is the extent of tropical deciduous forest habitat. And that's something we'll be talking about more when we get down to the Alamos area. But you can see this tropical habitat goes extremely far north. Um, and as a matter of fact, you do get some tropical indicator plants right around Tucson itself. So just to give you an idea how far south the Sonoran Desert actually goes, these are saguaro cactus in um, scrub thorn forest, just just below the elevation of tropical deciduous forest, um, 20 miles from Alamos. So quite, quite far south. And to see it in more of a, on a graphic here, all these little black spots are um, populations of saguaros, which is the, the grand Sonoran de desert um, indicator plant. And you can see down here in the south part where Alamos is, where the red star is, that there are some little pockets of saguaro still left. There's one pocket that's actually just a little bit south of Alamos, and that's the, the last one. So this is um, sort of what it'll look like that first day of driving down from Tucson. We'll stop in some, 
some Sonoran desert and grassland habitats, um, looking for birds like um, Ben Dyer's Thrasher. It's quite common in these areas and pretty easy to see, um, depending on the time of year a little bit, but they're pretty, pretty responsive. Bird you all recognize from Tucson area, black-throated sparrow, um, pretty common. Lots of sparrows. In the winter time, it's um, a fantastic place to go look for sparrows, um, with the migrants being all around in this grassland area. It's also an incredibly important wintering area for things like gray vireo. Um, anywhere between the grasslands north of Hermosillo to the, to the coast. That's not the gray vireo talking. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> this um, gray vireos are incredibly um, adapted to this part of the Sonoran Desert. They feed um, on little berries that come off the elephant trees. Um, so you'll get them down to the coastal plain and then all the way up into just at the foothills of um, the Sierra Madre. This one's perched in a, um, a trio catillo actually. And then there's lots of these guys in this part of the state. This is a greater roadrunner, of course. Somebody you see around Tucson quite a bit. Um, Sonora is a quite a melding of habitats. And then as I get down a little farther south, I'll show you another roadrunner, which is a lesser roadrunner, which um, these two over, they overlap in habitat in the Alamos area. And it's the only place where you have both roadrunners. When we get down to Hermosillo, I like to take people to probably one of the most productive birding areas I've maybe ever been to. Um, not necessarily the most beautiful place. Um, this is um, what's left of the riverbed of the Rio Sonora. Um, as it leaves Hermosillo and heads towards the coast, uh, much of the area has been used as a giant gravel collection area, a lot of extractive work. And then now those big pits are being filled in with dirt. And there's a giant um, development scheme going in for this whole area. Um, but in the meantime, you see all the pond. The ponds out here have are just incredibly um, productive for birding, mostly waterfowl and uh, shorebirds and wa and waders, but um, lots of raptors as well and burrowing owls and also all sorts of birds. Sometimes we get 80 to 90 species in a couple of hours um, just being in there. It's really ugly though. <laughs> it is quite horrific, actually. Um, it's really sad, but um, the birds seem to be okay with it. And if I was going to continue out to the coast, there's the coast of Sonora offers a lot of really great birding. Uh, it's um, this is a coastal area I'm referring to here, close to Wymus, and then south from Wymus all along the uh, the coast of Sonora. Um, this area is has a lot of mangroves, it has a lot of estuary habitat, um, great shorebirding, and uh, if you can get in a boat, you can go out into the sea and see blue-footed boobies and brown boobies and uh, red-billed tropic birds. It's, it's fantastic um, coastal birding. This generally in the winter months, not so much in the summer, although um, if you do get out on the boat, you get out to the islands, all the, the boobies will be breeding at that time and quite easy to get to. On the drive down, we probably would have seen several carrot, crested caracaras, but um, once you get down to the coast and into the plain, they're incredibly common. You see lots of them down there. And one of the neat little birds that's mangrove um, specific is this uh, little yellow warbler, also known as a mangrove warbler. Um, they uh, haven't been split yet, but it's a bird that's very habitat specific. You don't see them out of mangrove habitat, red mangrove primarily. Um, and they have a little bit of a different song and they look quite different from a yellow warbler. So maybe it'll get split someday. And there's lots of red knots and this is a picture of a couple of red knots, nearly breeding plumage on their way back north last year, a semi-palmated plover back there. Wilson snipes are incredibly confiding this time of year. They're just like walking around out in the mud and 
really easy to see and photograph as they're headed back north. Lots of burrowing owls in the coastal areas um, and agriculture in coastal areas, which a lot of times means the same thing down in Sonora. Um, much of the coastal plain has been developed into agriculture, um, which has been bad for some birds and quite good for others. But as you can see, it's quite beautiful down there. Here's a picture of um, the bay at Wymus. Um, and in front, you can see the beautiful scrub habitat that's still intact there. This is an area that has yet to be, be developed and hopefully won't be, but um, Wymus is a, or in San Carlos are rapidly growing cities. And this is also taken from one of the estuaries, mud flats um, in San Carlos area. This is Estero Soldado, the estuary of the soldier. And in the background there, you can see the, the twin peaks of Tetecaui, the uh, big geographic feature in San Carlos. Also, once we get down to the coast and some of the inland ponds around there, you can find really neat birds like this um, bare-throated tiger heron, something that you're not likely to see in the United States, maybe someday. Um, I think there's a couple of records. I know there's at least one in Texas, but uh, yeah, this is a, a beauty that we saw um, this last spring. Um, here's a sort of a more recent colonist to Sonora. Uh, when I moved to Sonora 25 years ago, there were no records of Northern Chicana in um, Sonora, but now they've become quite established and are breeding as far north as Ciudad Obregón, which is um, less than 300 miles from Tucson. So they're, they're, they're moving north. So once we're done with the coast and the grasslands, we're going to drive on up the mountain, um, make our way to the east towards the state of Chihuahua um, and up to a little town called Yecora, which is um, an old, it's, a, it's, it's still a logging town. Um, actually now it's become more of a charcoal town. A lot of, uh, a lot of charcoals made up there, but Yecora kind of reminds me of maybe what Flagstaff was like uh, in the late 1800s. Um, it's pretty rough and tumble, small, about uh, 4,000 people, and um, kind of hidden in a valley at about 5,500 feet. And then you can, up there you can get things like barrel and hummingbird quite easily. Um, they're a big deal when they show up in southeast Arizona, but um, they're relatively common up in Yucca, along with white-eared hummingbird, um, and some others that are a little bit harder to find in uh, so southeast Arizona. Some of the other birds like that are this like Rufus cap warbler, which is established in southeast Arizona, but pretty common up in the Yucca area. Same with flame colored tanager, um, really common in the oak forests right around Yucca, pretty easy to see. And this bird, not so easy to see, but pretty common in Yucca. Um, there's a Montezuma quail here, and uh, if you can't see it, they'll be no, but he's right there in the middle of the photograph. It's a good example of how well camouflaged it is. And one of the birds that is really easy to see around Yucca, but pretty much only in the late summer and early fall, are Aztec thrushes. Um, there can be large flocks of Aztec thrushes that time of year. They nest in the Yucca area. And I think some of the birds that show up in Southeast Arizona on occasion are probably overshoots that are leaving breeding grounds or on their way to breeding grounds and go past them. Um, this is a male um, and it's a um, real sought after bird. So if you ever wanted to go to Yucca in the fall, that's one of the birds you're likely to find. And there's some neat endemics in the highlands here. Um, this is spotted wren, um, and spotted wrens are close relatives of cactus wrens that you probably might have in your yards in the Tucson area. Um, this guy um, is very communal, more so even than a cactus wren. They see small family groups, six, eight, sometimes 12 individuals. Um, and they're communally nest. You'll see a number of nests all in the same area. 
And uh, this is about the northern limit for this bird in Mexico in the Yucra area. It's an, another picture of them. Spotted wren. And Yekra is also pretty much the northern limit for this sparrow. It looks like a rufous crown sparrow, but it's a rusty sparrow. It's quite robust, a little bit larger than a rufous crown sparrow, and you can see the bigger, blacker bill. And that little broken eye ring is a very good field mark. Another bird at its northern limit is this, it's another sparrow. It's actually brush finch. This is a rufous cap brush finch. Um, not common in Yakra, but you usually find them if we're, if we're looking around. And then one of the real prizes up there is um, mountain trogon. This is a, a, a male mountain trogon. Um, and to get this bird, we actually have to go up another mountain that's right next to Yakra. It's called Mesa Campanera. And it's um, about 7,000 feet, just under 7,000 feet high, and it's the highest point in the state of Sonora. And in that area, there are breeding mountain trogons. It's not only birds up there. Here's a, a Sierra Madre um, alligator lizard, really beautiful little lizard. A um, lot of neat reptiles up in that area. I was fortunate a few years ago to go into the Sierra Madre with Jim Rohrbaugh and was entertained by watching him turn over all sorts of logs for several days <laughs> looking for stuff. It is really great. A um, lot of neat flowers, particularly in the summer and the rainier season. Some parts of the Sierra Madre and, and that part of Mexico get 50 inches of rain a year. Um, and on a really good rain year, you'll get a lot of these Mexican shell flowers popping up and in all sorts of areas, um, more of the wetter areas, but it's beautiful flower, quite large. That flower is about four inches in diameter. And when we start to go down from Yecra, down towards Alamos, down towards Obregon, um, to the south, um, we'll drive through some foothill habitat of the Sierra Madre that's incised with all these fantastic deep canyons that start to reveal tropical habitat far north of where you would normally expect it. And there's a, a lot of tropical um, flora in this canyon, morning glory trees and fig trees. Um, down in this canyon, you'll find bare-throated tiger herons, uh, common black hawks, and green kingfishers, to mention a few. But it's a really beautiful canyon. It's very difficult to access, as you can see. <laughs> And then after about a four hour drive from Yekera, you get to the tropical deciduous forest habitat, some of the most extensive um, areas and pristine areas of tropical deciduous forest that exist now. A lot of it's been cleared for cattle grazing and agriculture and all sorts of things. But around the Alamos area, we're quite fortunate to still have a huge amount of forest that's still intact and quite beautiful. Um, this photograph is taken, oh, about 18 miles east of Alamos, um, obviously in the rainy season, um, but um, it's incredibly diverse and in incredibly rich with all sorts of wildlife. So once again to the map, down here, the red star, that's Alamos, right on the, in the bottom part of the state of Sonora, and the white stars mark where we've been to Hermosillo, Grassland area, Yucra in the mountains, and the, to the coast at Wymus. So, I, you know, I throw this word around tropical deciduous forest, these words around tropical deciduous forest, and uh, what is it exactly? Is a, um, it's trees and plants that have a dormant or leafless period that's pretty extended, actually. Um, our very driest time of the year has pretty much just passed us. So we had a really wet winter, kind of late rains, and so it's a little different than normal. But typically, May and June are the uh, driest and sort of the scorched earth time of year here in Sonora, where um, you, there's barely any leaf cover. And then it's the end of the month, like now, starting to come, um, the trees are starting to leaf out already because our humidity, uh, particularly last night, um, 
jumped quite a bit. Um, this morning I woke up and the humidity here was uh, 68%, which it's pretty hot. Um, so this is a tropical, tro the deciduous plants will start the leaf out again now. And some of this habitat moves a lot farther north and a lot of that's due to canyons or climatic differences. Like we get a lot of petering out hurricanes from this, um, Gulf of California and that gives us a lot more rain here. Um, Alamos gets nearly 30 inches of rain a year on average. And so that, this shows you sort of the, this is a more of a thorn forest um, desert scape here, but um, you can see the, the difference between one week in the beginning of June and the first week of July. This is also taken, this was taken at the end of May. This is um, just to the east of Alamos. And there's the same location in July. Quite a dramatic change. And this is actually um, the cactus that sort of takes over. It's a columnar cactus. It sort of takes over for saguaros once you get into tropical deciduous habitat. And this is a, an H, a H O cactus, a Pacaserius aborigium. It's even a different genus than, than saguaro, but it does look somewhat somewhat different and they're in the forest mostly um, they like to have a little bit of shade to get established but even here with all those cactus and saguaros 15 miles away um, we have fig trees this strangler fig is uh, just up the road from where we are now um, and we have uh, eight different species of tropical fig trees right here nearly just 15 miles from saguaro cactus and we have things like Gila monsters here, which are pretty much a desert reptile. And they don't necessarily intermingle with these guys. This is a Mexican beaded lizard, uh, but they are very close together. Um, they overlap slightly in habitat. And the desert or the um, beaded lizard goes all the way down into Central America and, and more. And, uh, the species we have here, subspecies we have here is called the El Fuerte species, and it, I think is the most beautiful. It has far more color to it. As you get farther south in Mexico, they get black. But this is just to sort of emphasize the collision, if you will, or the melding of tropical deciduous forest with Sonoran Desert um, in this one region. Uh, you may be familiar with ferruginous pygmy owls in the United States. There are some in a few places. This is a close relative of a ferruginous pig meow. This is a Colima pig meow. Um, we do have a lot of ferruginous pig meows here at uh, up to about 2,500 feet in elevation. When it's replaced by this one, this is a Colima pig meow and it's an endemic to Western Mexico. And they're smaller, believe it or not, than a than a ferruginous pig meow. And then if, actually, if you get up a little higher, we have northern pig meows as well. So some of the trips I do here, we actually see all three, if we're lucky. Um, nothing really screams um, tropical more than parrots. And in Alamos, we have four nesting species of parrots. And this is um, our smallest one, and it's a West Mexican endemic, only found in West Mexico. This is a uh, Mexican parrotlet, used to be called blue rumped parrotlet. These are lilac crowned parrots um, in a rainstorm on a Christmas count a couple of years ago. Um, they are relatively common here in the winter time. Uh, we see big flocks of them. They mix in with white fronted parrots, but they nest up in higher elevations actually. They're cavity nesters in pine trees or oak trees um, in the Sierra Madre. These are white fronted parrots. That's our most common Amazonian type parrot. Um, sometimes in the spring, um, I had a tour here in our last tour, hopefully not ever, uh, was in March, um, just before everything kind of changed. And we had flocks of five, 600 parrots flying around us at times. It was fantastic. And then we also have military macaws here. They nest in relatively strong numbers um, in the big cliff faces in the Sierra Madre and here on Alamos, Alamos Mountain. Um, we've had them not land in our yard yet, but um, we've had them fly over 
And I actually brought some seeds back. This is a haba tree that it's in. They love habas. They eat these big fruits of a giant seed inside. They really love. And I got some haba trees to grow here. And they're, one of them is 30 feet tall with lots of fruit. So I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll have them in my yard. We don't have a lot of hummingbirds in Alamos. Um, not really diverse. And there's a lot of hummingbirds, but it's not diverse. Um, this is a plain cap starthroat, which is pretty easy to see here, unlike in Arizona. Um, but then broadbill and violet crown are really the only other two we have um, consistently. I've had 14 species that are feeders over the years, but um, a lot of them are just for one time. Um, so we do get barreline at the feeder every now and then, but really not a lot of hummingbird diversity. So I told you there was another roadrunner, um, and here it is. This is a, a lesser roadrunner, and you can tell the difference between that and a greater is you look at the throat on this guy, and it's all clear. It doesn't have any streaking. And notice the extensive blue on the head. Um, rarely a lesser will have red on it like a, um, like a greater does, but generally they have none to very, very little red um, behind the eye. Here's another picture of one. This is actually full breeding plumage and they, they're actually pretty easy to see right now. Uh, they're out and about looking for mates. I've had them both in our yard. Um, they, it's another example of that melding of tropical and desert habitat. And we have a bunch of endemic birds in, in West Mexico and it, we have a lot of them here in the Alamos area. This is a, a happy wren um, named for its song, which is indeed quite happy. Like to <laughs> imitate it, Jeff? Okay. This is another, well, this, is, this was, I'm not real happy with this wren anymore because they're actually showing up way too much in Arizona these days, but this is a Sinaloa wren, which is also considered a West Mexican endemic. Um, but one of these days, you're probably gonna get some babies in Arizona, would be my guess. One of our endemic jays, um, they're just like a jay should be, super raucous and kind of in your face. These are black-throated magpie jays. And I, they come to my feeder and take all the oranges. They scare all the other birds away. They're nest robbers. They're incredibly beautiful. I'm so glad they're here. But boy, they're a, they're a force of nature. Um, unlike our other endemic jay, these are purplish back jays, and they have a very limited range. Um, they go from about Ciudad Obregón, 50 miles north of here, to um, about Puerto Vallarta, and that's the extent of their range. Um, there's actually quite a few birds that have that range of endemics that are only in that area, but purplish back jays are shy. They're not raucous like bagpie jays and they're a little bit hard to see. This is an adult with a black bill, but juveniles have a yellow bill. And this is a, not an endemic, but it's a neat tropical bird that we have big numbers this time of year. This is a, um, a black vented oriole. And our other beautiful oriole here is a streak-backed oriole, which is, um, which is um, it's pretty common. It's probably our most common oriole. And another Northwest Mexico endemic, which pre pretty much has the same range as the uh, purplish back jay is a rufous bellied chachalaca. And a new phenomena, we've got two uh, coming to our water feature like almost every day now, which has never happened before. And yesterday we actually found a nest on the property, which is a new, new for our property. Um, one of my favorite birds is yellow grosbeak and they just showed up, they're summer, summer migrant. They come up here pretty much just in the summer. We can usually find one or two on a Christmas count, but um, this time of year, they're, they're thick as thieves. They're all over the place and they nest here at the Pedregal. Also have a lot of rufous-backed robins this time of year. Um, big numbers coming in to clean the fig trees out. And one fancy looking quail, it's another Northwest Mexican endemic, kind of the same range as the jay and the chachalaca. This is an elegant quail. Um, we have, counting Montezuma quail, we have three species on the route that we would be driving. There, there are scaled quail up in the north, but this quail actually will interbreed with Gamble's quail on occasion. Um, they're a higher up, more of a tropical deciduous forest species, but just 
20 miles from here where we have Gamble's quail down in the coastal plain. And they do overlap a bit there and they, they actually interbreed. That's a beautiful bird. But a lot of tropical birds here kind of at their norm, northern limit. Here's a squirrel cuckoo. Um, bird you get around Tucson area and other places in, in the southwest is the um, very bunting. Nice male at my water feature yesterday. Um, we've got more and more group build onis, and this is another bird that's headed north. Um, they used to be in Wyamus was kind of where you could get them. And then um, my friend Carlos, who's the, uh, the eBird moderator for Sonora, he found, uh, he found some in, um, in Hermosillo last year, so or maybe the year before. So they're headed north, watch for them at a feeder near you. This is another bird that caused a lot of stir in Arizona, but super common here in Alamos. This is a Nutting's flycatcher. Tough ID, but um, we, don't, we don't have any ash throated here in the, in the winter. I mean, I guess if you go up higher, you might find one, but down around here, it's all, all Nutting's flycatchers. Uh, here, this is a fantail warbler. Another bird that moves around quite a bit. We find them right here on the property on occasion, but a little more common in the oak foothills. And one of the crazy birds we get here that I, somebody needs to do a study on this thing, but this is a mangrove cuckoo. And like the yellow grosbeak, this is a Southern migrant. We get them only for a short period of time in the summer, four or five weeks maybe. They come here, in early July, nest and leave. Um, there are no records of mangrove cuckoo in mangroves in Sonora, never have them. Um, but for some reason, there's this population that comes up to breed in the tropical deciduous forest up here around Alamos. And it's, um, I'd love to know where these guys come from. Um, maybe someday I'll get somebody to put a transmitter on one or something. <laughs> But there's also some cool reptiles here as well. Um, this is a Pacific parrot snake, um, really super arbolic. They love to be up in the trees and they're not a bird's best friend by any means. They, uh, they like to eat little baby birds and they will even eat eggs. Um, but there's, the, there's this Pacific parrot snake. There's another snake here called the brown vine snake that's similar stature to this, but um, as you would guess, brown, not green like this guy. We're also fortunate to have the largest coral snakes in the world here in Alamos area. It's actually goes down into Sinaloa, but some of these coral snakes get up to five feet long. Um, they're pretty impressive. I mean, you, you don't wanna try to get bitten by one, but they, they have a rather small mouth, so it's gonna be tough for them to bite you, but still you don't wanna mess with them. But it's pretty neat that we have these here. and. Uh, if you ever get a chance to pick up Jim Rohrbaugh's book and take a look at it, it's the reptiles of Sonora, it's pretty impressive to take a look at how many reptiles are here. And another bird that screams tropics is a motmot. -mot. And we are the northern limit for Rufus, um, Rufus crown motmot. -mot. And this is, this is a, a pair that we took, a picture I took here on the property last year. Here's a little better picture. Um, and it's a really fantastic bird. And it's a little bit difficult to get in the winter. We do have some that stay here all year round, but this time of year it is actually soon will become one of the most common birds in the forest. They're calling everywhere and, and uh, they're nesting in the banks, um, sort of like Kingfisher does. Um, so they're always looking for holes or some sort of little cavern they can be in. We have a pair nesting in an old well above our property on the park right now. And so that's kind of the end of our trip. We're down here in Alamos and we had a long drive back up to Tucson over the next couple of days. But um, this is my parting shots here of the Sierra de Alamos, the, one of the most beautiful mountains. It's uh, a sky island. It's actually considered the furthest southern sky island of the chain that sort of starts up in the Tucson area. And there's a lot of endemic plants and a lot of, um, birds that are just stuck in that area. We need to someday know like, how did those Montezuma quail that are up on top of that mountain get there? And it's 
pretty long way to fly from the Sierra Madre. But I want to thank you all again, and um, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, and then on the way back, we're going to go back to the United States and welcome to the USA. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jen right now. She's got some interesting stuff about the uh, conservation efforts down here that she's been involved with for a long time. Well, we both have been, but her a little more directly than I. Um, but I hope you're having a good summer and making the best of all of these crazy times. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, Luke, how are we doing? Um, I see a bunch of uh, chat things. Is there anything we need to? Uh, yeah. So, so one one question before we move into uh, the conservation part of it. Um, what what is the best birding? Uh, let's see. What Linda asks. It sounds like the best birding is this time of year. So. I, I think what Linda's asking is what, what time of year is best for the birding right. down there in Sonora? Good question. I, I mean, I guess the best way for me to answer that is um, if you're looking for more specific things, um, I think, I, well, October is fantastic for a couple of reasons. Mostly the, the climate has changed. It's got a little cooler um, and all the migrants are coming through. So as far as numbers of birds, October through March, even into April is, um, is quite good for lots of birds. This time of year, like starting in early to mid April up until the rains begin at the beginning of July is my favorite time of year birding here, but it's warm. It's not the best time of year for birders. Um, we've had trouble trying to run any trips out here this time of year, but and unfortunately because there, it is really fantastic. I mean, the, the cuckoos and the gross beaks and the, all the southern migrants, this is when they're here and easy to see. Um, and our feeders are just crazy. So there's kind of two times of year. Um, the fall, winter, early spring seems to be the most popular. Oh, that's good. Uh, we don't have any other, oh, here's a question from Tim. Uh, for those who might want to explore snoring birding on their own, can you offer any advice on practicalities like driving, lodging, thoughts on safety? Yeah, you, you bet. Um, it's, uh, they've just redone the entire main Highway 15 that goes from Nogales all the way down to the Sinaloa border. It's uh, four lane with big shoulder on one side and small shoulder on the inside by the median. It's all concrete. It's, it's, it may, it's one of the best roads I've ever driven on anywhere and it, they've just completed well actually there's a little tiny place they're still working on but it's almost completely done so the driving the roads are excellent the road from Hermosillo up to to Yekora is also excellent it's a asphalt paved road but it's pretty wide and it's super comfortable to drive and in really good condition so in general the roads have improved a lot in Mexico since we moved here 25 years ago um, as far as safety goes if you stick to the main roads and don't go wandering off into some property you don't know about or know whose it is, um, you're not gonna have any trouble. Um, and it's good to go not alone necessarily. It's always good to be somebody else or a few people. Um, there's great places to stay. Um, Hermosillo's loaded with every hotel you can imagine. Um, chains to small ones to giant ones. Uh, Yakura, has some limitations on places to stay. Um, <laughs> that'd be a nice way to put it. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not interesting. Um, I stay at a little place called the Hotel King that, um, well, it's never really seen better days. It's always been kind of bad. But, uh, but, but it is interesting and it's really Sweet. close to where you can bird. Um, here in Alamos, there's a whole range of options of places to stay. So it's definitely something you can do on your own. Um, and we have a lot of people that come stay with us here at our hotel that do want to do it on their own. And we, um, we help facilitate that, whatever they need. Yeah, one thing I was going to say at the end of the talk is whether, you know, whether people go on a trip with us or want to travel in Sonora or elsewhere, um, you know, we have a lot of information, not just about Sonora, but we run birding trips all over Mexico. And we like to promote tourism in Mexico and um, 
So we're all, we, I get a lot of inquiries from people randomly about uh, going on a trip to Puerto Vallarta or to the Yucatan, and we're happy to share information as we can, so. Um, Great. You want to go into your part, Jennifer, and then maybe we can, if there's more questions at the end, we'll, we'll do that. Well, cool. as most of you, um, I would imagine most of you as, as we uh, not only love to bird and botanize, nature lovers, but we're also very interested in working where we live to make a difference and help um, work in conservation and protect the habitat that supports the life of the nature that we love, the birds that we love. And so um, I just wanted to share a little bit with you about some of the efforts going on in the region. Um, I, uh, aside from helping, we run our bird tour company and we have our little hotel here in Alamos, um, but I also work for an organization called Nature and Culture International. And that's gotten me more involved with um, conservation here in, in this area. And it's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, just on a macro level, uh, in Mexico, uh, the protected areas are overseen by CONAMP, which is the Commission for National Protected Areas, Natural Protected Areas. And there's about 177 of them. You can see the stats there on the slide. Um, people live within these protected areas, not all the way through them and everyone, but they're not, um, not without human habitation. And one of the distinct differences between protected areas in Mexico and protected areas in the United States is that um, they don't own the land. And so uh, the land is all privately held, almost all privately held. And so the effectiveness of these protected areas is only as good as the people living within it and owning the land, following the rules and regulations. Enforcement isn't very strong. Um, and CONAMP just had, is um, going through major budget cuts here in Mexico. 75% of their budget is proposed to be cut, which is massive. And so um, we will see what happens uh, in relation to CONAMP and their projects here in Mexico. Um, it's very worthwhile having them and we need an organization like CONAMP to, to, to help move the conservation forward. But also private land conservation has really proven to be what is the most effective way to do conservation in Mexico. Um, here in Sonora, um, this is sort of a closer up view of Baja and Sonora, and uh, there aren't a ton of federal, federally protected areas in, in Sonora, one up in the Pinacate, and then there's one here in Alamos, and there's a couple up in the mountains. There's also the dots are private land, um, private conservation efforts. A couple that I want to highlight um, here in Sonora um, that many of you may be familiar with is the Northern Jaguar Project. It's in north central Sonora, way up in the mountains, really remote. Uh, the closest town is Sawaripa. Uh, Diana Hadley, a Tucson uh, gal, a woman who, and her crew have done an amazing job doing conservation in that region. They have about 50,000 acres in conservation, plus about 40,000 acres of neighboring ranchers that participate uh, in their camera trapping project. And they have been very successful with their efforts. They also are very active in the community of Sawaripa, involving the schools and involving the community. Uh, it is key in conservation, as we well know, to engage the local community and see the benefits of um, conservation in their, directly in their lives. And so we like to give a shout out to Northern Jaguar Project. They're doing really great work. And um, we uh, collaborate with them on a variety of different things. And um, also may be familiar to you, and actually Luke mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, El Arivavi, formerly known as Rancho El Arivavi, uh, their logo now doesn't include that. It, it's a, a great example of a private landowner that was a rancher that wanted to diversify the, the use of their property and do it more sustainably. And so they actually got, um, uh, federal protection status um, through CONAMP, and it's a, a natu natural protected area, and they are doing ecotourism, research, and other more sustainable activities, and it's another great example, and we would love to see more ranchers 
evolving into this type of uh, scheme. CONOP does have a variety of different ways to put your land into conservation and the organization that I work for, Nature and Culture International, facilitates landowners putting their land into protected status. Um, here in Alamos, um, for those of you that haven't been here, uh, it is an absolutely beautiful Spanish colonial town. It's a Pueblo Magico, a magic town here in Mexico. Uh, it's about 12,000 people. It is a colonial jewel. It's known for its architecture, um, small streets, no stoplights, great community. We've lived here for 25 years. We love it. And it's also known for the uh, tropical deciduous forest that surrounds it, that, as David mentioned. Um, naturalists and uh, of all kinds have been coming to Alamos for a long time. And um, to, for all of the richness of its biodiversity, and there is, it's really a, a treasure just literally right outside our doorstep. Um, in 1994, CONUP created a, an almost 300,000 acre uh, protected area of the Sierra de Alamos and the Cuchahaki River. Um, and their presence here is an indicator of how important the biodiversity of this forest is. And also, as I mentioned, Nature and Culture International, um, is also present here. Uh, it's a small nonprofit based in Del Mar, California. Uh, they work mostly in South America, as you can see by this crazy map. Uh, they have protected areas all throughout Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, Brazil, and here in Mexico. We are a small portion of what they do. They are really doing profound work for our planet. They have a bottom-up philosophy. They employ local people. They work with local governments to create protected areas. They're very effective, and I can't say enough good things about this organization, and we're very lucky to have their presence here in Alamos. Um, our flagship, they've been, we've, we've been, um, well, they've been here since 2004. I've been working with them since 2012. Um, they began purchasing land here. They created what is Reserva Monte Mojino. Right now, it's about 18,215 acres and growing. We are effectively a reserve within a reserve. We are a reserve within the federally protected area. Um, as I mentioned, all land within the reserve is privately owned. So we are landowners uh, that um, we have a Mexican, Mexican nonprofit. We own the land, we put it into a conservation status, and we are a very important part of what CONOMP does here in this region. And um, it's about 10% of the federal, federally protected area. And our main goal is to protect the watershed of the Rio Cuchahaki River. The Rio Cuchahaki, which is kind of a cool name and hard to say, but it's um, about 70% of Alamos's water source. So it's very important to the town of Alamos that it's protected. And uh, we are involved in water quality studies and work with the city to give them the information and try to improve the situation of water here. Water is a big issue in this area. Um, the reserve itself is kind of a weird shape. Um, what you see here is um, the green is all, the dark green is all the properties, which are the ranches that we've bought over the years. And then the light green are uh, potential purchases that we would like to eventually get at some point to kind of complete the vision. Um, and you can see off to the right, the little map kind of gives you a sense. Um, of where it is in relation to Alamos. Alamos is the little um, red dot. And um, you can see, it's a really lame map, sorry. Um, the, dot, the outline dotted line is the, the federally protected area and the dark green in that map is what is Reserva Monte Mojino. Um, and like I said, it's mostly to protect the watershed and obviously the forest that surrounds it. Uh, the Cuchahaki River uh, runs year round sometimes a lot and sometimes barely at all, but it runs. Um, it's dammed further down close to um, El Fuerte in Sinaloa. And uh, it's, a, it's a magnificent river. It's magnificent habitat. You can see the, the Montezuma Cypress, the Sabinos on the edge of the, the, sh the shores of the river. This is in the some rainy season. The change, as David showed you, is drastic. Uh, that feature is Cerro Redondo. It's one of the main features within the reserve. 
It's very charismatic. This is from another view, same flower, different view, different season. Uh, these are the Sabinos, the, these, these arroyos that are filled with these massive Montezuma cypress. The Amapa, which is one of the signature trees in our area. It's a, a, a pink blooming tree in the winter time. It also blooms yellow, covers the hillsides. You can see it's pretty rugged. Um, it's kind of hard to get into the reserve. Uh, it's about 12 kilometers east or 12 miles east of town and up to about 25 miles, but you need four wheel drive and a lot of that. And, but it's well worth getting out there. We have a couple of little houses that it's kind of like um, glamping, rancho living, but it's, they're, they're pretty comfortable and running water and that type of thing. We're also very interested in working with the local communities. We do scientific research, community development, environmental education. This is a mural we had painted in town when we did one of our Day of the Jaguar festivals. A little bit about scientific research. We're, we have an ongoing relationship with the University in Obregon and they do, they're doing ongoing studies in climate change, carbon sequestration, and the water, water quality studies that I mentioned here in Alamos. And um, there's a lot of potential to do more work with them. We've had studies done of the endangered palm uh, that grows all over the place in the reserve, but it's also used a lot for um, roofs, palapa roofs and that sort of thing. So we've been doing studies on how to harvest that sustainably. We've done, we've had Charlie De La Rosa, uh, a colleague, and he's on the board actually of our Mexican nonprofit here. He, um, he uh, did, has done a, his PhD project on cat grazing and what types of plants the cattle prefer, how to influence cattle management practices so that they're more friendly to uh, the habitat. This is a picture of, on the right, the, uh, not, not the reserve, and on the left, the reserve. You can see how much is cleared for cattle, a full grass. And uh, we've been involved in a uh, camera trapping study for many years now. And um, we have a very healthy population of jaguar, a relatively small reserve. We have, I think the last count was eight different, eight different animals, one of which we believe was a female. We have yet to see the cub, but we're hoping actually for more sure. pictures. Yeah, kitten, not a cub. <laughs> and, um, and actually we're getting some more cameras right now. We've had a couple of uh, broken ones and whatnot, but one of our park gar our reserve guardians is in charge of the setting them. And then we have a science, science advisor that analyzes all the data, but they're pretty magnificent. Um, never seen one. We've heard them uh, roar at night camping, but have yet to uh, see one. If, but the park guardian, the guardians, they've never seen one and they're there all the time and they've lived there their whole lives. So, but I'm holding out hope. And you can see the little, little baby uh, ocelot over here in the picture. Um, we have five of the six types of big cats in Mexico here in the reserve. Um, and we, we're done missing the jaguarundi but I think that's a little further north than here. And we've done in the past, we just finished up a, a cavity nesting survey. We've done breeding bird survey, IVA monitoring, thanks to funding from Sonar Joint Venture and from Tucson Audubon. Our reserve guardians are uh, local guys, using birders in their own right, and amazing naturalists really, and you know, primary school education, um, but they're really phenomenal out in the field and they've been instrumental in doing our bird surveys and um, we look forward to doing more, but it's, been, it's given us a, a great baseline data for the reserve. And um, you can see Jane Burstein, she's famous in Tucson Audubon, great gal. <laughs> and this is a while ago, this picture. Um, and we also do, uh, I think we've done 10 now for bird counts. Uh, okay. Yeah. And um, oh my gosh, it's a great count. It's really logistically challenging to plan and execute, but it's always rewarding. It's always fun. We, we get great birds, we get great people, and it's a great way to get people out into the reserve and um, you know, explore this country. 
um, in a really well supported way. Um, it is a lot of work though. And each time we do it, we're like, oh my God, we're never going to do that again. <laughs> and then we do it again. But um, this was last year with Lauren Harder and Dave Stetchkel, uh in up one of the canyons. And then we do, we have done environmental education. We're not doing any right now. Uh, we're actually working on some grants to resume it because it's something that we really uh, value, but our funding ran out. So we're working on that right now. But um, we have uh, really enjoyed um, working with children, both here in Alamos at the primary school level, uh, also in the little village of San Sur, which is the closest town to the reserve. And it is a whole lot of fun. And you can see this Kaufman guide done in Spanish. It is so important to budding birders here in Mexico. It is an invaluable tool and donate the guide or some organization has given, we have gotten so many and we give them to anybody who has an interest in birding, whether it's a ranching neighbor, a kid, a mom of a kid, um, we, we really, um, share them and get them out there. We've told Steve Howe, who wrote the book for Mexico, to, we asked him our trips and asked him, we asked him if he would do it in Spanish and he said no, that we had to do it. And so we haven't, we haven't done it. But as you all know, I think getting kids out birding and getting kids, uh, them more connected to their natural world is, is so important now more than ever. And um, our, our most recent grant that we're working on is children, art, nature, and health of not only their health, but the health of um, their, their environment, their planet. And so uh, we've also taken um, uh, high school students out and just tried to be a, a source of uh, a place where people can uh, go to to facilitate different events like this. Um, and our community, devel community development project is called Art Saab. It's with the women of the same village in Sabanito Sur. And they already were great artists in their own right, but um, we helped kind of um, evolve what they did um, and improve that upon it. And, and their tagline is uh, Bordando Naturaleza, which is embroidering nature. And we help not only develop what they're doing, help provide materials, but we help sell it as well when we you know create events or when there's groups here and that type of thing. And, and it's been um, very satisfying. Uh, it, I have to say it's been kind of challenging. It's a little bit like a soap opera sometimes with all these women in a little village and jealousy and whatnot, but um, it's, been, it's worthwhile and we've really made great headway over the years. They also do great baskets. Um, we have also done where uh, we've gotten commissions to do logos of different organizations. You can see the Northern Jaguar project here in the Navapatia field station. So that's been a great thing to do as well. And it's just a lot of fun to work with them. Out on the, another, beyond Reserva Monte Mojino, NCI does help create protected areas and help people who are landowners put their land into conservation. A place that's near and dear to uh, our hearts, as well as Lydia Lozano, who's the director of NCI Mexico, is the um, uh, one of the big resort or esteros at the bottom of Sonora, it borders Sonora and Sinaloa. It's called Estero de Ajiabampo, and uh, it's where the Navapatia Field Station is. Uh, they've been there for a long time, doing bird monitoring and um, ecotourism at small scale. Um, there's an incredible stand of uh, organ pipe cactus, Pifayal cactus, goes right down to the ocean. It's highly threatened habitat, and we are working slowly to create uh, a reserve in this area to protect the last stands of Pifayal forest. We have a grant from the World Land Trust, and we've also had funding from the Fondo Mexicano to work with the locals, to work with the fishing cooperatives. For those of you who don't know the area, this map's probably kind of insignificant, but that's kind of the, the, the last remaining stands of Pithayal. That's what it looks like, and that's what we're working to um, protect. It's challenging because of the landowner situation there and a number of other factors, but we're working with the state government, and um, we're trying to create a state reserve out there with NCI's oversight, and um, we'll see how it goes but it's absolutely magnificent place, um, well worth a visit. This is the Navapatia field station. It's glamping at its best with the estuary right out your door and birds um, abound. And then back here closer to home, Parque La Colorada is uh, 
pretty much our baby. It's something that we have created. It's a park and green space for the community of Alamos. It's about 280 acres of land. We have about 20 kilometers of trails. The, um, we, we are supporting recreation, education, and conservation, creating a place where people can get out into the natural world, enjoy it, get healthy, ride, hike, bird watch, stroll, walk your dog, get curious about the forest, learn more about it, and then really want to care about it. And so there's nothing like this in Sonora. It's, it's pretty much uh, a unique project and one that we hope that can be replicated in other places. Um, but it's been obviously a lot of work, but it's very satisfying. Uh, you can see here, this is like the park up in this area. You can see some of the overlooks over here and you can see where town is. So it's really right on the edge of town. It actually goes all the way down here. And um, it's, um, it's really been phenomenal to see the response, not only of the local community, but um, visitors who come from all over Sonora, basically even Sinaloa to come to Parque La Colorada. It's really become a huge thing for Alamos tourism. Um, this was on a, we've done five Earth Day walks. This is a little kids mountain biking school that some friends of ours have started. And um, we've taken group kids out there. This is the Desert Museum. They came down during Dia del Hawad and the environmental educators from there, Robin and Catherine did a great job out in the park with the kids doing bird watching and bug collecting and drawing. It's also, we got it protected. Um, uh, Lydia Lozano here on the right, uh, this is when they gave us our big fancy certificate that it's a uh, nat natural protected area. So it's conserved in perpetuity. And that's another nice shot of out, this is like the park in here, the reserves laid out in this area. Here's town right in here. And then this is our shameless self-promotion part, which is, uh, <laughs> this is where we live. And uh, we're, we're coming to you right now from this spot right here over here in our house. And this is our, um, our, uh, our little hotel. We're on 20 acres of land. We're actually right adjacent to the park and right next to town. And um, it's a great place to come and enjoy some time out in nature. We have eight little casitas. We have a beautiful property. We're on 10 acres. Look at that bed. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take a nap right now. And, uh, and uh, that's our view of the park right here. The park's here, that's the Sierra de Alamos. And uh, that is pretty much the end. We hope that you can come visit us sometime. We, our doors are open. We, we really miss having guests here. It's been a great place to uh, shelter in place, but it's weird having this place all to ourselves with no people. And we have had no guests for almost four months. So it's pretty sad <laughs> and we're, really waiting for things to open back up and uh, receive guests here safely and, and um, working at um, doing everything we can to, to get people back here. So thank you so much. Yeah, Jennifer and David, it is great to have you with us. A few questions, a couple that are really important. One, um, so people wanna know how they can support the conservation efforts down there along with the local environmental education that you're doing with kids. Um, so maybe talk a little bit how we can be a part of supporting that. And then also it would be great, like if there's uh, links or anything that uh, would be good for people to go to, send those to me so I can uh, put out into the uh, recap email that we'll send out later today. Okay, great. We really, I really appreciate the question. Um, Yes, um, there, well, Nature and Culture International, uh, you know, that's what they're, they're, the park and Nature and, Nature and Culture International are kind of like uh, so, socios, uh, you know, they help, like the NCI is our fiscal sponsor for the park. I work for NCI doing outreach and fundraising and kind of overseeing the projects. And um, there's a great, uh, very uh, symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, Nature and Culture International, I'll send out, the, I'll send you their um, uh, information. It's natureandculture.org. Nature and Great. Great. And um, I'll, that you can specify what your donation is for because obviously I have programs all over the world and you can say, I want to support 
this project in Mexico and whether it's uh, overall NCI, what they're doing here in Mexico or for just for the park. But I can, I'll send you a little email, Luke, and give Perfect. people specific information about how to donate for which project and, and uh, you know, and any and all support is extremely welcome. And it's all tax deductible, of course, in the United States and actually here in Mexico too. We have nonprofit status on both sides. Um, but it's, um, you know, we exist. I mean, the park has been done um, entirely with um, donations, the land purchase, um, the ongoing management, it's all done with um, donations and um, we're, we're super grateful for any, any support. Um, we love doing it all. It's very important to our quality of life and we feel it's a really important being part of this community to also give back to this place that's given so much to us. Yeah, uh, fan fabulous. Hey, uh, a couple other questions. Um, Jim asked, I, I think it's Jim Rohrbaugh who asked, I I'm sure it is. <laughs> Uh, he said at Estero Aguia Bampo, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that like it likely has crocodiles. Have you ever seen them there? Never. No. Um, I don't. But I've heard that. I've uh, we've I've actually heard that before. Um, and somebody actually told me they thought they're um, extirpated, but um, we haven't heard. But I will certainly ask. Um, we one the first thing we've done down in that area uh, with the funding that we got was working with the fishermen doing more sustainable fishing practices because that's their main livelihood. So that's how we started getting into working in the area um, to get them involved in conservation of some kind. And now it's kind of um, evolving it into some environmental education and like not only protecting the fisheries but the habitat the mangroves and the habitat around the reserve and so the guy that's working with us on that i can certainly ask him to ask them but we do not we're not aware of them being there well if they were there that would be another high point i'm sure yeah. <laughs> uh, nancy has a question that we'll get to you real quick nancy but uh also uh, do you guys, are you able to do cross-border trips right now uh, as a business? Is the border open for you? Um, we well, it's a very, very good question, Luke. Um, so the border's open um, both ways to um, all but non-essential travel. So um, for and for American citizens. And so, I mean, like, for example, if we had to go up to Tucson to do whatever and come back down, we could do it. What we're unsure of is whether, like for example, we have a small group that wants to go to Madeira to see the thick-billed parrots in August, uh, kind of a private group. And um, we aren't sure that they'll let us into Mexico or back into the United States. We're-, we're Well, so far they're, they have. They're, they're, they're issuing visas. So we're assuming that you can, you know, but it's, um, it's a little bit of a, we're going to try to go for it in August. Um, but again, everything that we're planning is also in a wait and see mode because everything's evolving so much right now. So. Welcome to our world, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. That's yeah. just how it is. Yeah. Um, Nancy has a question, so I'm going to unmute Nancy. Nancy, you want to ask your question? Well, I just wonder if, how the food works at your hotel. Do the casitas have kitchens? Do you have a restaurant? Do you, you... Uh, we, we have great food. We love to eat and we love <laughs> to make good food. And um, we have an organic garden here, thanks to Dave. And so we, uh, well, when, before COVID hit, we were start opening a restaurant and um, it's a really bad time to open a restaurant now. And so, but our plan is yes, to have a restaurant here on site that you can eat at, so you can eat food here and also minutes away in Alamos, there's a number of other great restaurants for more traditional Mexican food and other fare. Um, so it's, uh, yes, there will be, um, a restaurant here in the future. There hasn't been. We've in the past we've done only breakfast, and then when we have groups here, we do other meals, or we've done stuff by reservation. But in the long term, we plan to have a restaurant here on site. Cool. Hey, good question. Thanks, Nancy. Anyone mm -hmm. else have a question? You you can raise virtually raise your hand or wave it, and I might see you.
All right. I think we're good. All right. Any so yeah, I'll send we'll send off some information to you, Luke, that you can share with everybody. And um and uh yeah, and if anybody has any other questions or just wants to get in touch with us, um, we will certainly uh, you, um, you can I guess you'll share our information, Luke, as well. Yep. People can yep. email us and like I said earlier, we're happy to help with any questions you have about traveling in Mexico. Um, we have a lot of sources. Uh, we have a lot of contacts all over the country. People that we use as our touchstones for what things, you know, think how things are going in different areas. And um, uh, you know, we just like to support like the, all the hotels and tour uh, tour guides and transport people that we use, especially now more than ever. All hotels, all. Uh, everybody's suffering and so the more we can help them now and in the future it's uh, we're happy to do so yeah looks like we do have one more question Judy do you have a question you you have to unmute there you go yeah. um, when we're finished Luke I want some help please with this oh. check problem thank Got you it. I'll do it yep <laughs> thank you <laughs> yep. all right hey thanks uh, Dave and Jennifer really appreciate it I'm a unmute everyone so there might be some background stuff but uh that way if people want to clap or say thank you you should all be good to go thank now. you thank 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 <laughs> well, I can't travel, so I have to behave. Yeah. Yeah. You be good. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, Mom. That I do, which will probably be celebrated uh, here at home. Just myself and my husband. We're really trying to stay away from people. Yeah. Um, we do have people over every now and then, but we make them sit out in the backyard six feet away from us. <laughs> uh, but doing, doing pretty well. No symptoms to talk about. Um, um, pardon? Well, thank you guys so much. And uh, thank you. Yeah. We'll close it up here. So uh, we'll be in touch again soon. Okay, okay, thanks, Luke. Bye, everybody. Yep. Adios, everybody. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.